reading poetry. In your book, chapter 22, which begins on page 755. <clears throat> Based upon your responses, the first day of class when I asked, I think it was the first day of class, when I asked how many people read poetry, pretty much nobody said yes. And I don't read poetry regularly. Um, but you all listen to it, and you're familiar with it. You see it sometimes on billboards. You hear it on TV as uh, jingles for commercials and such. It, it kind of permeates our, um, our society, though we don't think of it as that. Okay? So page 755, as we begin studying poetry and analyzing poetry, I want you to look at that paragraph at the bottom of the page. Because this advice, and I don't agree with an awful lot of what Michael Meyer, this, this um, editor compiler, says. But this I do agree with. Try reading the following, uh, not just the following one, but try reading every poem you read aloud. Get the sound of it actually in your ear. Not just in your mind's ear, but in your real ear. Read it aloud before you read it silently. Yeah, you might stumble, but just keep at it. So, turn for a moment. This is a poem that's not assigned on the syllabus, but I am going to kind of um, add it. I do this every time. And I do this because you probably haven't read this. Right? Look at the poem on page 757. Author is Robert Hayden. I have no idea who he was other than he wrote this poem. Lived from 1913 to 1980, and he wrote this poem, and it was published in 1962, Those Winter Sundays. Okay? You've got three relatively short stanzas. First stanza, five lines. Second stanza, four lines. Third stanza, five lines. So, Those Winter Sundays. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know? of love's austere and lonely offices, okay? Now look at the next, very next thing. It's a question. Does the poem match the feelings you have about winter Sundays? Notice that assumes you have feelings about winter Sundays, that you could somehow abstract generally what you think about Sundays during winter, okay? So notice what this poem says. First stanza, what's it say about the father? Okay. The father does what? Sundays, what's the next word? Not two. Sundays, two. What does the two mean? He does it every other day. Every day of the week. This guy's up early. And what does he do? He got up early, put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Blue-black, that's imagery, which we'll talk about later. How can cold be blue-black? Louder? Frostbite. Frostbite, maybe sleeping outside in the cold. I mean, you can get frostbite when it's cold. Still in the early morning. Still in the early morning. Before what? Sunrise. Before the sun is risen. Okay. Notice it's not the black cold. That is, it's not 3 a.m. It's the blue black. It's like the sun is just below the horizon. Maybe half an hour before sunrise. Where you can just start to see on the horizon the color changing from black blue. And what did he do? Then with cracked hands and ache from labor in the weekday weather. So, what's he do for a living? I don't mean specific occupation. 
is a doctor, lawyer, accountant, professor? No. Blue collar, possibly. Indoor, outdoor? Why probably outdoor? His hands are cracked from labor in the weekday weather. He works where during the day? Outside. His hands are cracked from the sun, the wind, the rain, and from, I don't know, farming, mechanic, possibly. I've known a few mechanics, even mechanics who work inside a garage. The garage usually isn't that warm, okay? But it's implied he's outdoors in the weather, okay? So with cracked hands that ache, he does what? He made banked fires blaze. What does the poet mean by banked fires? How many of you have been to a bonfire? Is that where like fire is put out last night? Okay, yes, but it's not put out. It's the fire naturally dies down. Okay? If you've ever been to a bonfire, spend a night at a bonfire, you build up a big old fire, it's nice big flames, and the next morning what? Coals and ash and embers. So what do you do? Take that bonfire, put it in a wood stove. Okay? So when you go to bed at night, if this is your only way of heating your home, and it's implied here that it is, you don't have central air and heating, what do you do? You bank up the fire at night. You put two or three logs on it so that it burns all night long, so that in the morning you have a pile of embers. And what do you do? You shake the grate, you get the ash to settle, and you bank it up. You put wood on that so that it heats up. No one ever thanked him. Why should they? Father's responsibility. It's father's responsibility. Should they thank him? Notice what he's doing. When he gets up, what's the temperature of the house? You think it's 68 degrees? If you do, you're wrong. If you've ever lived in the kind of house that this person is describing, and I grew up in Northern California, not, I think this guy's from New England, not New England winters, okay? But we would get down in the 30s at night. Not very cold, actually. But I lived in a house that did not have central heat and air. And in the, I didn't know, I was, guess I was about 10 or so, we put in a pot belly wood stove in our living room. And generally would use that to heat the house. But when you get up at 6 a.m., 5 a.m. in the morning, and there's no fire, and you have no central heat and air, and it's 38 degrees outside, and you're living in a stucco house, a you know, stick house with stucco on the outside, guess what the temperature is inside? 45, 50? That's pretty cold to wake up to. When I lived on a log cabin on Lookout Mountain, for about six months. And it was the winter of 1985, which was the coldest winter on record. We had three straight days in January of below zero temperatures. It did not get above zero on Lookout Mountain. And in this log cabin, which these were built for summer residences, they were fairly old. And the chinking, the mortar between the logs, was so bad you could see daylight often through the walls. So I would, you know, I nailed up, stapled up a blanket on the inside of the walls in the room that I had. I, I had a roommate, he had another part, right? That thing would sway in the wind, okay? During those three days, the toilet, the water in the bowl, the water in the tank froze solid. It gives you an idea how cold it is inside, okay? No one ever thanked him. He's doing this with sore hands, cold, I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. How does cold splinter and break? What does every house do, no matter how old it is? It settles. If I were to put this in the freezer for several hours, 
What would the water do? It'd expand. Why? Because it would freeze. And then if I put it out in the sun, so when it expands, I notice with a cap on, what's going to happen to the shape of the bottle? And then when you put it out in the sun, it's going to contract. Houses do the exact same thing. So when he builds up that fire, the house starts to crack. Why? Because it's expanding from the heat. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. Let's everybody stay in bed till it's warm enough. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. What chronic angers? What's that tell us about the house? Is this, you know, the hell house where the house itself is haunted kind of a thing? No. What are we being told about the family that lives in this house? Chaotic. Chaotic. Ray just gave me a look. They don't get along well. There's a lot of anger here. Speaking, notice, slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him. What's it mean to be indifferent? Apathetic. Apathetic. What's a one-word phrase we use today that implies that? That's indifference. Whatever. That means I don't care. I don't care whether you live or die. I don't care what you do. Just go away. Leave me alone. So, is it the chronic angers of the house that are speaking indifferently to the father? Or is it the speaker of the poem? Who had driven out the cold. This all is supplying information about the him. Who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. Why did he polish the speaker's good shoes? What day is it? Sunday for church. Notice, the father does this even though what seemingly fills the house. Chronic anger. Is the chronic anger proceeding from the father? If your father really was always angry at you, would he get up and warm up the house for you? Would he get up and polish your shoes when his hands are sore and tired? What did I know? What did I know? Why is it repeated? Why do we sometimes repeat words or phrases? Emphasis. What did I know? What? Of love's austere and lonely offices. Notice the tense. Did win. What did I know of love's lonely and austere offices? Win. Then. Those winter Sundays. Those implies what? Back then. Who's the speaker? Male or female? Any words that give us an indication? Whether the speaker is masculine or feminine? Nope. Can we speculate? That is, we can't say 100% sure, but can we go out on a limb a little bit? Why would the speaker say, what did I know, what did I know, of love's austere and lonely offices, unless the speaker now knows? In which case, the speaker is identifying with whom? And if the speaker is identifying with dad, doesn't that imply, notice, it doesn't explicitly state, doesn't that imply that the speaker is a son? And the speaker is going, damn, I should have been nicer to dad. Why? Because now I've got brats like myself. 
who don't what? Appreciate anything I do. Right? Now, what did that reading of that poem, of that poem that we just did, what did that involve? As we kind of work through those 14 lines. Notice, paid attention to individual words, paid attention to phrases, paid attention to clauses. Start with the smaller, work out to the larger. Paid attention to stanzas. Okay? Did we only pay attention to the denotations of words, the literal dictionary definitions? Nope. We did in some, but then we also looked at what? Their connotations. What other meanings those words suggest. Okay? So, we got a long paragraph that kind of looks at that poem, analyzes it. Top of 758. What is most important about your initial readings of the poem is that you ask questions. That is, you'll never understand it if you just read it and read it like you watch TV. You can't do that. Okay? If you read responsibly, that is, like the poem is a person sitting in front of you talking to you. Ideally, you would talk back. Okay? That's the responsibly. You'll find yourself asking all kinds of questions about the words, descriptions, sounds, structure, and then some of the language that we use to describe, you know, fiction and drama, tone, style. Look at the next poem, John Updike, Dog's Death. This is one that is on the syllabus, so we'll talk about it now, and then we won't talk about it later. 1969 is when he writes this. Several stanzas. She must have been kicked unseen or brushed by a car. Nothing alike the emphatic statement. Okay. She, title's telling us it's a dog, so the dog must have been kicked or brushed by a car. Too young to know much, she was beginning to learn to use the newspapers spread on the kitchen floor and to win, when in there, the words, good dog, good dog. It's a puppy, right? It's being house trained. We thought her shy malaise was a shot reaction. Dogs often do that when they get shots. They just get all kind of um, lethargic and want to sleep off the reaction of the shot. The autopsy, that told us what? The dog's dead. You don't do an autopsy when it's only something wrong, because that means you cut it out and pull all the organs out. You don't put them back. The autopsy disclosed a rupture in her liver. That's why she must have been kicked unseen or hit by a car, because the liver is fairly protected. This dog took a pretty good blow. As we teased her with play, Blood was filling her skin, and her heart was learning to lie down forever. Now, I should have prefaced this and said, as I've done every year since, what year was that? 1994, in teaching this poem. If you've recently had a dog die or a cat die, you can leave at this point. Because if I finish this poem, and you were close to that animal, you will be in tears. First time I taught this, that morning, opened my garage door and my dogs ran out. And one of them, about an 80 pound offspring of the other dog we had, ran out into the street as the car came. And I just saw it fly 10 feet. And then I had to teach his damn poem. <laughs> it was pretty, yeah. Monday morning, as the children were noisily fed and sent to school, she crawled beneath the youngest's bed. Why do you think she crawled beneath the youngest's bed? Take a guess. It was her dog. Or she was the youngest's dog. We found her twisted and limp, but still alive. In the car to the vets on my lap, she tried to bite my hand and died. I stroked her warm fur. My wife called in a voice imperious with tears. 
Though surrounded by love that would have upheld her, nevertheless she sank and stiffening disappeared. Back home, we found that in the night her frame drawing near to dissolution, that is, the dog, as it was dying, had endured the shame of diarrhea and had dragged across the floor to a newspaper carelessly left there. That is, this newspaper wasn't put down for the dog's house training. It was just a newspaper lying there. And the dog saw it, and the dog had diarrhea, and the dog thought, if I make it there, what? Pavlovian response, right? Good dog. Good dog. So the question, what would it mean if the title was changed to Good Dog? rather than dog's death. Now, what kind of poem is that? Somber, right? Melancholy. It's designed to do what? I mean designed. Make you sad. It is overly sentimental. I mean, Updike knows exactly what to say to kind of pull on your heartstrings, okay? So let's go over some terms. Top of 760, doggerel. And I'm not going to, you know, ice cream, you scream, we'll all scream for ice cream. That's doggerel. What's it mean? Subject matter is trite. Rhythm and sounds are monotonously heavy-handed. Really? Because ice cream, you scream, we'll all scream for ice cream means what? Yay, ice cream. That's pretty much it. Okay? 762, paraphrase. It's a prose restatement of the central meaning of a poem in your own language. Just like when you paraphrase what somebody else has said. Okay? Keep going. We're going to skip a bunch of pages. We're just going to hit a lot of these terms. And we're going to talk about a couple other poems too. Bottom of 768. Speaker. I just referred in both those poems to the speaker of the poem. The speaker of a poem is not the author. Okay? The speaker is the voice used by the author in the poem. That is, it's usually some kind of created speaker. So that you don't think the author, excuse me, you don't think the speaker of those winter Sundays is, what was his name, Hayden? Robert Hayden. It's somebody else. Okay? Now, a lot of times, people will assume that the speaker of a poem is the author because the author might give indications that the poem is autobiographical. Okay? But don't assume that to be the case. 770, verse, pretty simple. Lines composed in a measured rhythmical Patterns that are often, not always, rhymed. 771, theme. We've already talked about that. Because it's the same thing across drama, poetry, and fiction. It's the central idea or meaning of a poem. Okay? Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. What's the theme? That's the object. A theme is always a statement about an idea. We love ice cream. That's it. Okay. Notice I didn't say anything about anagram. Don't worry about it. 772, lyric. What's a lyric? If you listen to songs on a radio, you're listening to lyrics all the time. Okay. Brief poem expressing personal emotions and thoughts of a single speaker or a singer, if you want. Okay. You got a little short one there, the anonymous. Western Wind lyric, okay? But then you can have different kinds of lyrics, 773. Poem that tells a story, excuse me, not the lyric. Poem that tells a story is a narrative poem. Did, well, narrative poems are usually longer, not always. 
Did Dog's death tell a story? Kind of did. Did it tell it beginning, middle, end? A very, very long narrative story is an epic. Okay? What's an epic usually about? Heroic deeds, important events, and you get several mentioned there. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey okay, are two examples. The Old English Beowulf, Dante's Divine Comedy, Milton's Paradise Lost. Hopefully you'll get a point in your life where you will um, want to read one of those. 774 and 75 give you 12 suggestions for approaching poetry. Okay? For how to read it, how to understand it, maybe how to actually enjoy it. Okay? Which I'm not going to talk about those. Just going to keep zipping on along. Okay, go on to Page 779. Clichés. Guess what? Clichés, how we use the term in everyday ordinary speech, also applies to poetry. Ideas or expressions that become tired and trite from overuse. Like when somebody says, I stand shoulder to shoulder with See, most people don't, most people think that just means, you know, you're standing up beside somebody, kind of bucking them up. That's an old military term. Goes back to the ancient Greeks and the phalanx. It means if your shoulder is touching the shoulder of the person next to you, nobody can break through that shield wall. If you do this and give them a gap, you're screwed. Okay? So shoulder to shoulder means there's no daylight between us. Stock responses, these are predictable. Conventional reactions to language, such as dog's death, okay? which is also an example of sentimentality, which is down there. Go on to um, no, oh, it is in there now. I'm going to have to add this. Ed Ground Pose, the Raven, is in here, which has not been in this edition before. Um, go on to, we're not going to, you're not going to be writing about poetry, but you've got pages 794 and 95, 26, okay? Questions, suggestions, etc., for writing about poetry. These are all good ideas to help you to have in mind while you're reading a poem to help you understand. For example, just the first view. Who's the speaker? Can you determine age, sex, etc.? Is anyone being addressed? How do you respond to the speaker? Okay. Does reading the poem aloud help you understand it better or help you appreciate it better? It might not help you understand it better, but hearing the sounds might make you go, whoa, that's really cool. Okay. Go on. Chapter 24, word choice. We talked a little bit about this, I think, with fiction. Diction. Author's choice of words. And then on the next page, you see different kinds of diction or different levels of diction, if you want. Poetic diction, use of elevated language rather than everyday language. That is, poetic diction is not the kind of language we normally speak. Shakespeare used poetic diction in all of his plays. If you've ever read the King James Bible, translated 1611, that is using poetic diction. Nobody said in 1611, my cup runneth over. They said my cup runs over. Okay? The F ending, that's old-fashioned. It's intentionally archaic. 
formal diction, dignified, impersonal, elevated use of language. Again, not normal speech. Right? So you get a little example of the Thomas Hardy poem there, The Convergence of the Twain. It's about the Titanic. The Convergence. What does a convergence mean? Meeting of the twain? Two. The meeting of the two. It's talking about the Titanic hitting the iceberg. Okay? In a solitude of the sea, deep from human vanity, and the pride of life that planned her, stilly couches she. Stilly, that is, eternally, ever, couches, like reclining on a couch, lies the Titanic. Okay. Middle diction. Next one. This is the language spoken by most educated people. Educated means college educated. Okay. And you have a little example. Informal diction. That's what most of us speak on an everyday, ordinary basis. Okay. It's colloquial speech. When getting my nose in a book, cured my nose. My mo cured most things short of school. It was worth ruining my eyes to know I could still keep cool. Okay. Keep cool? Putting your nose in a book? That's a figure of speech, right? Because you don't put your nose in a book because that would hurt. Right? Dialect. We're all familiar with dialect. Why? Because if you weren't born and raised in the South, you are currently living in the South. And you can hear all kinds of Southern dialects. You can hear Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Florida, north and south, and middle. Okay. Spoken by definable groups of people from a particular geographic region, economic group, or social class. Okay. Jargon. Anybody in here recording industry major? Anybody in here engineering, science, business? Well, if you are, each one of those has their own jargon. Jargon is kind of shorthand, speak. It's, it's code language so that you don't have to go on and use all the ideas. Okay? Denotations we talked about, connotations we talked about. Look at 804. Okay? 805, you have persona, a speaker created by the poet. Notice what the persona is. It's the speaker of the poem. But the persona is kind of a, almost an embodiment of that speaker. Little poem on bottom of 804. Death of the ball turret gunner. What's a ball turret? B-17, flying fortress. You, have, you could have a turret on top. You could have a turret on the bottom, on the belly of the plane. The ball turret gunner is the guy who sits in that turret with the machine gun, and he can rotate. He can't rotate 360, but he can rotate quite a, quite a range. What's his purpose? Shoot down any fighters that are chasing me. Okay? Notice the title tells us what? This guy's dead. <laughs> okay? From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loosed from its dream of life, I woke to black flack in the nightmare fires. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. <coughs> From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state. Now that could mean I was born into, why is state capitalized? Usually when it is, that implies like the government. Well, who goes to work as a ball turret gunner? You're working for the military, right? That's a branch of the state. But he's also implying I was born to do this. Why? Because he was drafted. This is World War II. And I hunched in its belly, that is, the belly of the state, till my wet fur, what wet fur? Are we talking a werewolf or something? <laughs> well, if you know anything about bombers in World War II, flying 20, 30,000 feet, they're not heated. That's why an authentic bomber jacket is really expensive. Because these things are lined with were real fur. That's to keep them warm. 
So why did the wet fur freeze? And why was the fur wet? Sweating. Why is he sweating? Because people are trying to kill him. And he's up 25, 30,000 feet. How do I know that? Six miles from Earth. So that as soon as he sweats, that sweat freezes on the inside of that fur. Six miles from Earth, loosed from its dream of life. That is, when I was down there on the ground, this isn't what I thought life would be like. I woke to black flack and the nightmare fighters. When I died, they washed me out with a turret, of the turret with a hose. Okay? So that's the persona is telling us that. And then you have a long paraphrase of the poem, page 805. Ambiguity. Bottom of the page. Ambiguity. What is something if it's ambiguous? Louder? Yeah. Eh? Not quite. More than that. It's not really clear. What this... It's not clear, so you can do what? Manipulate. You can manipulate. You can infer more than one thing. That is, it has more than one possible meaning. Right? Because I could say, great job, Jacob. I don't know. And how I say that could imply two different things, right? Like, great job, Jacob. Or, great job! One sarcastic, because it means what? Just the opposite of great job. It means you suck. And the other one means you nailed it, okay? Ambiguity, a little bit of advice for, you know, other classes. Ambiguity is not what you want when you write a paper for a professor. You want it to be black and white clear. If you're writing poetry for a creative writing class, go hot crazy with, with ambiguity. Just make it so that everything can mean anything. Okay. 806, word order, syntax. Syntax is simply your arrangement of words in a sentence or in a line of poetry. Okay. The ordering of words into meaningful verbal patterns is called syntax. And you, you know, have a longer discussion. Tone, we've talked about that. It's the writer's attitude towards the subject. What's the tone of dog's death? It's somber, it's sad. What's the tone of the death of the ball turret gunner? Is it sad? It's kind of ironic. It's kind of like, wow. Right? It's the mood created by all the elements in the poem. Bottom 808, dramatic monologue. Okay. Look at the second word first. What's a monologue? One person talking. One person talking. Every late night comic, before the late night comic has his or her guests on, they do what? They give a monologue. It's supposed to be funny, usually <laughs> they aren't. Okay. A dramatic monologue, however, implies what? Dramatic implies there's more than one person. Why? Because the speaker is addressing a silent audience. Okay? And the speaker, in a real dramatic monologue, always reveals something about him or herself that he didn't really need to reveal. That is, he just starts talking and does what? says too much, okay? And we're going to read one of those in a couple days. 812. Ditch in a tone and four love poems. Carpe diem. I wrote that up on the board earlier, several weeks ago. Anybody remember what it means? Seize the day. Why? Because, God forbid, you might be like those 11 Jews at the synagogue on Saturday. Who weren't there on Sunday and aren't here today. Because you don't know when your time is up. Okay? Usually it's implied in the context of love or sexual desire. Like, honey, you better you know, lose it now. Because if you don't, you're going to be old and wrinkled, and then nobody's going to want it. Okay? 
So you have Robert Herrick's To the Virgins to Make Much of Time. It's a poem I've got later on the syllabus. We'll do it now. Robert Herrick, 17th century poet. This is page 812. Four stanzas, four quatrains. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Okay? So, first quatrain begins with a single image. Go pick rosebuds, not roses. What's the difference between a rosebud and a rose? The rose has opened up. The bud is still more or less closed. Why? Because time is flying. And the flower that smiles today, tomorrow, those petals will be dropping off and dead. First image. Second image. The glorious lamp of heaven, the bright thing out there right now. The sun, the higher he's a-getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. East, west, the sun rises. What happens when it reaches the, what's PM stand for? Prime meridian. What happens when it reaches noon? It starts to set. Okay? The sooner will his race be run and nearer he's to setting. That's the second image. Third image. That age is best which is the first. Not meaning when you're a baby. When youth and blood are warmer. How can your blood be warmer when you're young? We'll talk about that in a minute. But being spent, the worst and worst times still succeed the former. In the Renaissance, which is when he's writing this, it was a commonplace, that is, it was an idea generally held that when you're young, your blood is warm and very fluid like this water, very vis, uh, not viscous, the other one, like this. Think of hot bacon grease. You've just fried up bacon, and you take that pan, you do this, right, and the grease sloshes back and forth. But the older you get, it's like bacon grease. Set that pan down and let it sit for an hour. It doesn't slosh as easily. Let it sit for several hours, and it what? It congeals. It hardens. Your blood is like this. My blood is like that bacon grease that's been sitting for a couple hours. Okay? That's what the poet is saying. Then be not coy, but use your time. And while he may go marry. Now the marry there doesn't only mean put a ring on your finger. Okay? It also means M-E-R-R-Y. Okay? Go happily, go joyfully. For having lost but once your prime, you may forever tarry. Now the title is To the Virgins to Make Much of Time. Should that be retitled to the women to make much of time? Are only women virgins? No, they aren't. Okay. After all, Steve Carroll had a movie, The 40-Year-Old Virgin. Okay. Is there anything else in the poem that suggests the poem is intended for women? There's one word that suggests that. It's a word, it's an adjective that is not usually applied to men. It comes in the last quatrain. Then be not coy. Coy is an adjective that's almost always reserved for women. What does it mean? If she's playing coy, if she's being coy, what does that mean? It's another phrase for that. Playing, louder ring, hard to get. That is, playing the game. Because that it implies that the one being coy 
does desire, let's say, the speaker of the poem, but doesn't want to give in too easily. So don't be coy, but use your time, that is, your youth. Why? And while you may, go marry. That is, it does mean this. Go get married while you can. While you're young. Why? Having lost but once your prime. When you're old, you may forever tarry. What does it mean to tarry? Wait. Wait. You've all seen signs. They don't say no tarrying here. No loitering here. What's it mean to loiter? To wait around. You may forever tarry. If you lose your youth, your beauty, your sexuality, all that kind of stuff, you might what? You might wait for it forever. Why? Because once you're old and wrinkled, nobody's going to want you. That's Carpe Diem. This is one of the two most famous Carpe Diem poems in the English language. We're going to read another one. Probably not today. Maybe no, actually, I forgot it was right on the next page. Yes, we will. Andrew Marvell, just a few years later, less than 40 years later, he writes this one. I think we can do this in seven minutes. So this one has three stanzas. Okay? And it begins a bit differently, but it also gets really disgusting. And I always have to decide, am I going to point out the really disgusting stuff and explain it? And I usually will. <laughs> Had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. Had we but implies we don't. Okay? So her coyness is a crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou by the Indian Ganges side, that's the Ganges River in India, sacred river, Shouldst rubies find, I by the tide of Umber would complain. Umber is a river in northern England. North of that is called Northumberland. Okay. So, if we had rolled enough in time, you could sit by the Ganges River, I'd sit by the uh, Umber River and complain. It doesn't mean he's going to sit there and moan and bitch about how horrible his life is. Complain there is, has a specific meaning. I would write love songs. Complaints, as they were called then. I would love you 10 years before the flood. What's the flood? It's capitalized. Yeah, it's Noah's flood. So 10 years before Genesis 9. All right? And you would do what? And you should, if you please, refuse to a conversion of the Jews. When's the conversion of the Jews? The end of time. So... Ten years before Genesis 9 to the end of the world, you could say, no, to me. When? If we had world enough and time. All right? And so what would he do during all that time? My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. Vegetable simply refers to the time it takes to grow. Plant a pumpkin seed... And it takes about 120 days for that pumpkin plant to develop and grow a fully ripe pumpkin. I planted watermelon back in, I don't know, August. And they're just now almost big enough. Of course, they're probably, you know, crap because we've had a couple of freezing days. So, he says, and it would grow what? Vaster than empires, like the Roman Empire, the Grecian Empire, Philip's, um, Alexander's Empire, and more slow. And what would he do during all that time? A hundred years should go to praise your eyes and on your forehead gaze. So he's going to spend, what do you say? A hundred years. A hundred years for eyes and forehead. Two hundred to adore each breast, because we're assuming she's normal. Um, but 30,000 to the rest. What has he just done? Where has he started? And he moves south. <laughs> Tells you where his priorities are, right? 
An age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. Why? Because it really, that's what's most important to me, is your heart. Yeah, right. For lady, you deserve this state. No, what I love it. Lower rate. Rate implies what? What kind of language is rate? Not like she's a 10. Not that kind of rate. You look like you... Close. You look like you have money. the fee? It's close. How many of you have... I shouldn't ask this by law. How many of you have student loans? What is your APR? Or a credit card? Your annual percentage rate. It's an economic term. Baby, I love you so much. You're worth at least 7.8%. Okay? But, but what? At my back, I always hear time's winged chariot drawing near. What is time's winged chariot? Well, time is portrayed often how? We're getting ready for Halloween. Death, the grim reaper. He's coming up with that chariot. Getting ready to do what? Take your legs out from under you. And yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Why is the eternity described as beautiful garden? Thy beauty shall no more be found. We're not going to finish this. Nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Her marble vault, when she's dead, he goes, I won't be able to sing to you. No. Then, though I will get to the dirty part, worms shall try that long preserved virginity. What is, Irene knows what he's getting at. What does the try mean? Prove. Test. Worms will go in and out. What you didn't let me go in and out of. And your quaint honor turn to dust. Hold on, we've got two more minutes. Quaint. If something's quaint, it's what? Could be small. What else could it be? Fine. Okay. But this comes from the Middle English word quainta, which doesn't mean fine or small. It's the same word, I don't mean to offend, that gives us the word cunt. Chaucer uses it in his Wife's of Bath's Tale because there's a guy in the Wife of Bath's Tale who's described as henda, which means handy, Nicholas who goes around grabbing his girlfriend by the quinta. Think of him as the 14th century Donald Trump access Hollywood tape. Okay? There it is. Okay? Well, uh, okay, now we'll stop. And we'll come back and pick up with his lust turning into ashes. I will have your exams for you on Wednesday.